I don't hear you, Glenn. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're good. It helps if I unmute. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so uh, welcome everybody. I'm Glenn Raker, KE0 UWC. And this will be an overview of chasing balloons of what edge of earth sciences does um, in terms of ham radio and other things. Let's see if I can find my slide clicker here. Oh, there we go. So edge of space science, oops, wrong direction. Go back. Edge of space sciences, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, with our goal of promoting science and education using high altitude balloons and amateur radio. Uh, the payloads we do take get about 99% about above the Earth atmosphere, or as you've probably heard in recent years, the poor man space program. So uh, we've been involved either directly or indirectly with about 75,000 students in about 55 schools. Um, we do about 15 to 20 flights a year for various organizations, uh, universities, and that sort of thing. To date, we've had 335 launches and we've had 335 recoveries. Um, if you're interested in more information, uh, I do have the website listed there. The other thing I'd like you to know about for EOSS is this year we're hosting the Great Plains Super Launch or better known as GPSL in Colorado Springs. The dates for that are August 1st through August 3rd. August 4th is a backup date for launches if there's a problem. And I do give the website there for that as well. So in terms of operations, um, <clears throat> we have to, we work with the FAA or the Federal Aviation Administration um, in regards to unmanned balloons. And that's part of their regulations is known as 101. Um, and balloons can either be an exempt or non-exempt, but they must meet criteria in either case. So exempt balloons can be flown without any FAA permission, and non-exempt balloons require notification of the FAA and some additional items outlined in that part. Um, so the exempt criteria is in subpart A, and for examples of those, um, no payload is to be over six pounds, and the whole payload weight cannot, the whole payloads that you have on a balloon cannot exceed 12 pounds. For an example of some non exempt criteria, um, that requires you notify the FAA with a predicted flight path, and then you have to report the position to the FAA. And those are just kind of some of the examples of some of the differences in the exempt and non exempt ones. EOSS does have a waiver regarding um, some of the regulations. But with that waiver, we also have some other requirements that we have to do for having that waiver. For exempt flights, we do have some items. Um, we do some of the same things as we do for non-exempt flights because we want to maintain good relations with the FAA. So give you an overview, we have the launch site and we have seven approved FAA launch sites. Um, we also coordinate with the FAA and Denver Traffic Control as part of our waiver. We have our balloon there with our payloads on it that get, goes up from the launch site. Then it takes about 90 minutes. It's going to get to about 80 to 100,000 feet. Either we'll release the balloon for some reason or it will pop. Then the, the parachute fills up with air and it starts coming down. And we send tracking teams out that locate the payload. We find the landowner. We look to get permission to access the land. So that as, when it comes down, it takes about 45 minutes to come down. Then we can hike and recover at the landing site. So for local communications um, at the ground station in the field, we use UHF band primarily. Um, that one of the reasons for that is we want to minimize interference on two meters because we're uh, transmitting APRS data on two meters and we don't want, we'd prefer not to interfere with that so it's easier to find stuff, as it were. We also use repeaters for our pre-flight net and for our ground station to field communications, both analog and digital. 
Um, we do like the link repeater systems that several that such as RM Ham has, and we've used um, because we can get some distance between the ground station and the trackers. For example, we've launched out a deer trail, and the flights have come down somewhere around Burlington, Colorado, to give you an idea of some of the distance they can travel. Um, EOSS does have payloads we put on there. They do broadcast out APR APR. S packets for position, and we used a different frequency than the standard a APRS frequency for that. Um, the bottom payload we usually put on there also is a digipeter because um, that way it can act as an eye gate um, for us to some degree so we can hear other stations in the area. And then um, it also helps with our tracking ability. Um, to find them, but in some cases where something goes wrong and maybe things don't work out correctly, um, we also have to have tracking abilities with direction finding in case things don't work well. So this is a picture of that as well, talking about our amateur radio usage, our launch site and grounds, the analog and DMR radio communications, and for the FAA coordinations. Um, we have the repeaters located on hills. For our flight string, we have the redundant APRS beacons. Um, we also have uh, independent uh, automatic dependent surveillance for aircraft known as ADS-B beacon. This is a flight beacon that actually has a tail number so that the um, FAA can actually track the balloon and aircraft knows where our balloon's located. And then our tracking teams have the analog both have analog and digital radio communications. Um, <clears throat> we also have an SDR-based APRS system, so we can receive the packets in and process them. And some of the, some of the people have capabilities of doing eye gate as well. So for our ground station, this is uh, a layout of it to a certain degree. We use the 70 centimeter FM and DMR repeaters our two meter a APRS system. Um, we do we can receive the, AD, the ADS-B and upload that as necessary. And then we also have our flight coordination done with the ground station, um, bo vo both voice and ADPRS uh, data pushes uh, out to the web. And we're very thankful that we got a donation from CBS Chat. Denver CB, CBS Channel 4, um, they donated a van, so we now have a mobile ground station because uh, the person doing this, um, Jeff, who's in the van here, um, used to do this when we did it in winter. It can be very cold out there, so this gives us a way to bring all the equipment, get it set up in a nice, timely manner, and uh, stay warm at the same time. It's been very nice. <clears throat> As far as the balloons are concerned that we do fly, the, we have two sizes we fly. We fly a 3,000 gram balloon as non-exempt and a 1,500 balloon as exempt. Um, the weather will determine the size of the balloon that we can use. Um, if we're going to do a 3,000 gram balloon, we can split it into two 1,500s if the visibility is less than five over 10, which means that if there's too many clouds in the sky, then we have to go to smaller balloons. <clears throat> um, all the items that we're going to send up for the payloads for the balloons are weighed to determine how much lift we're going to need, and we do add a factor to that um, <clears throat> for that as well. We use hydrogen filling hydrogen to fill the balloons instead of helium because helium has become expensive and it's hard to obtain, and it usually takes about one and a half bottles for filling a balloon. And so on the next chart here. Um, we have a trailer where we do take the tanks of uh, hydrogen out um, <clears throat> to the site for launch. And this gives you an idea how big the tanks are. So when I said it takes about one and a half tanks, you can kind of get an idea how, what the size of those. And then <clears throat> when we do uh, inflate the balloon, here's a picture of one on, of, uh, on the ground. So you can get a, roughly an idea of how big it is when it's when it's down at ground level. And here's some more of that, uh, the, uh, the balloons. And then um, you can see us on the right-hand side, 
where the balloon's being filled up. We have the hose coming out from the trailer and they have a bag of weight at the bottom of this so we can determine when it gets when it starts lifting on the tape off the table. Uh, we've got we know then we have enough uh, helium and uh, hydrogen in the balloon that can lift the payloads and fly away. So this is a payload plan, and this is how we plan for what we're going to put on the balloons. Um, it has the information regarding the payloads and to a certain degree the payloads themselves, such as weight. Um, it gives the layout of how we're going to put things together or string them up, as it were. Um, it tells us how much uh, estimated uh, gas we'll need to put in the balloon <clears throat> of that nature. Um, we usually have, EOSS has four standard payloads. We have a release payload, which is on the top here. We have two tracking beacons, which is, this is the top one, and then we have one on the bottom. And then we have the AD, ADSB transmitter as well. For the student payloads, they're put between our items over here. And they have various size and purposes. Um, for example, some will collect, some of the people have collected environmental data, such as CO2 level, UV level, temperature pressure. Um, some people do photographs and videos. Um, some look for observation and changes of plants. And the plans for our flights are on the website. And to give you an idea of uh, how big the packages are here, so we have some pictures of those of being strung up, being prepared for launch. So you can kind of get an idea of the sizes. Um, here, I have another picture of that. So the more payloads they are, there are, the smaller they tend to be because we do have the weight restrictions on what we can, how much we can fly. And you can see we have quite a few there that are fairly small compared to the other ones. And this is when they're laying them out, getting ready to go. We also have the balloon and the our, our payloads and transmitters here as well. And then we have launch. <clears throat> so the balloon's released, and everybody's holding on to their payloads, and they go up. And you can kind of see them strung out, what it looks like after they're launched, as they're all, str as they're all strung together. For our tracking teams, um, usually we have five to seven vehicles <clears throat> with a team in each vehicle. Um, they pre-position downrange to track and recover. Um, we do use radios to communicate between the trackers and the ground station. Um, most teams do have the software-defined radio tracking system. And then we'll cut down the balloon um, if something happens to it. So um, sometimes there may be a manufacturing defect where as it's going up, it starts to come down. Um, <clears throat> so we'll release the balloon so it doesn't get tangled up in everything. Um, if we have to do that, the trackers will send the commands to tell it to release the balloon. They also, uh, after it lands, they need to find landowners and get permission to go retrieve them. And then they do coordinate going out to the field to retrieve the items. So you can see we have a bunch, our, quite a few people lined up with their vehicles with quite a few antennas. And then <clears throat> this is a couple of pictures showing the payloads after they've landed. Um, some of the students out here looking at their payloads. Here they're they are showing off their payloads after they recovered them. Gets an, give you an idea of how, when they come down, how they're kind of put together to a certain degree. <clears throat> this is a group of people that are off to go find the payload out here. And this gives you another idea of the size of the payloads. And after they recovered them, you know, looking pretty good. For the payloads that we fly as part of this effort, we have four payloads, the custom payloads. We have one that's a release payload, which will uh, basically cut the balloon or release the balloon from the parachute and let it go away um, <clears throat> on a command. That's our that's the one uh, one of them. The other one we have is an APRS beacon. Um, and the balloon release controller, so it will tell the release to go ahead and let the balloon go. Um, 
it, it reads an accelerometer to see if we have a balloon burst um, and then sends a release command to do that. And it does that via Bluetooth. Um, the ADS-B beacon um, is basically the transponder and it uses 1.09 gigahertz <laughs> uh, for transmitting. And then we have a bionics-based APRS digipeter and beacon, which puts out less than a watt. Um, uh, it's on a different frequency than the top beacon so that it, we can locate them. And here's some pictures of what happens if the balloon uh, doesn't get released after it bursts. Things can become entangled and uh, quite quite messy, as it were. For the tracking, um, <clears throat> we have an ADPRS application to aid in recovery. Um, it's software-based, so it's not necessarily a traditional radio. Um, it gets simultaneous, gets receptions of the ADPS packets on multiple frequencies. Um, we use an offline mapping system called Open, open Street Map. Um, it also calculates landing predictions. Um, it's fairly lightweight. It leverages a web browser as an interface. You can kind of see that, not the web browser, but what it, kind of, what's outputting here. And it's receive only, so nothing's being transmitted or uploaded to the internet. Um, with a valid call sign, though, you can do eye gating and FR beaconing if you um, configure things accordingly. <clears throat> so to give you an idea of how this works, we have a GPS puck. We have some software um, defined radio hardware here. We have an antenna. Uh, we have a small computer um, and some open source software that people have uh, May uh, integrate to work well together, and then via Wi-Fi network, we can use a browser. Um, you can use various devices. We don't have any wires connected to it, and then you can also have multiple users use it as well. Um, the specification for our small computer it's an Intel i5. It has four cores, eight gigs of memory, and 512 gigabytes of storage. Got a couple of questions in the chat here. If you want them real quick. Okay, let me see if I can find my chat there. I can I can read them to you. Uh, Chris at K0SWE says, do you know if EOSS has ever had issues with landowners or troubles locating them? Um, for my experience, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to find landowners. I do know they've had a... Um, sometimes it's a bit more difficult because you're showing up and there, you know, people are a bit more suspicious about what you're doing out there and why you want to go do something. For the most part, most of them have been pretty cooperative and understanding and some cases even helpful. Um, sometimes they ask us not not to go out there uh, or limit, lim they might ask us to go out there with a limited amount of people, not a whole uh, bunch of people to recover it because they, uh, one of the cases I know there, they had cattle out there during calving season. So they wanted as few people as possible to go get the stuff and bring it back. There's another question here from Roger W3MIX who says, what kind of static discharge mitigation procedures do you take when working around hydrogen? Uh, that's a good question. Um, for the most part, we make sure that we use uh, cotton gloves for what we're doing. So we don't build up a static discharge. We also... Um, try to mitigate you we, we have it out in the open there as you see as well um and try to make sure we we keep what we're doing to a minimum if we can but i'll have to put that as something i'll have to ask some of my other uh some of the other people there uh about that as well let's see let me go back a slide here. So they did have a build party where they put all these together. <clears throat> so that's what you're seeing here. They're putting them together and doing some testing. Um, <clears throat> you can 
so when we do the when we do track things um and we have APRS package we've enabled our devices to connect to the and somebody has a connection to the internet they go to the EOSS kiosk um this is a limited version of the SDR tracker and so when we are tracking things um you can go see where what's going on by going to this particular website So I do have some contact information. If you have questions or are interested in things, um, here's my contact information. Uh, thank you for your time. Does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, Ed James asked, why do you use a non-standard APRS frequency? Um, I think it's so we don't interfere with other APRS traffic. Um, and we have a better chance of getting our position uh, in terms of uh, the it's balloon also, itself. It's also to keep the traffic from interfering with you. Yes. Are there some other questions? Speaking of APRS interference, uh, if you were on the standard frequency, how far and wide do you think I get to be picking up your transmissions? Probably got a pretty large range from up there. Uh, yes. Um, I, I, I have. I don't know how far it'd be for sure, but it'd be. You probably could have I get. I gave some people picking it up in Denver after we first first launched out of Deer Trail. Um, the further east it gets, usually, well, most of them tend to go east. Uh, usually, the further you get out there, there's you know less eye gates, as it were. So it may be that you get quite a few. You probably get quite a few if you get up to eighty. Being you're going to get up to hopefully eighty thousand or above feet. So. 250 to 300 miles easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs>